morning, everyone, or good evening in other parts of the world. I would like to thank you for joining us today in our Zoom meeting in Mass Cultures on Zoom with uh, one of my mentors. In fact, he's uh, my main mentor in regenerative medicine. That's wh where I trained under him uh, way back uh, maybe 10 years or eight years ago in Florida. And uh, it was a very distinguished privilege for me to learn from him because uh, all the other things that I've learned right now is because uh, I learned it originally from him. So I am so happy that uh, Dr. Joseph Perita, who is an orthopedic surgeon, will, will be able to join us today to give us a lecture on the topic on osteoporosis and what is the role of regenerative medicine in, in addressing these uh, problems. But before we begin, let us just pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity that we can come to you and learn of these uh, new uh, treatments for osteoporosis. Can you guide us and help us, O oh God, to learn and experience your presence and that we may be able to help our patients as well. We ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Joseph Burita, our orthopedic surgeon from Florida, would like to welcome you again in our lecture today. Please go ahead, Dr. Joe. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and good morning and good evening and good afternoon, uh, regardless of where you are. And I, I always have to say that I, I have a special fondness in my heart for the Philippines. I've been there a number of times and have a lot of good friends there. And I'm looking forward to hopefully getting back there one of these days. Okay, so basically you can see that I mainly practice in Boca Raton, but I also practice in the Cayman Islands. So tonight uh, or today, we're going to be talking about osteoporosis. Now, first, I'm going to give a lot of the... the uh, basic science about it and, and what we know about it. And then I'm gonna, at the other half of the lecture, go and discuss how we can use regenerative medicine to treat osteoporosis. So you can see there, now osteoporosis is basically a loss of bone density and strength. The word osteoporosis means porous bone. And we can see here by the bone architecture, that being an orthopedic surgeon, you know, I've operated on many osteoporotic uh, patients in the past you know, hip fractures, et cetera. And you many times wouldn't see bone like this, you'd see bone like this, which is kind of very thin and papery and, and it really would not support uh, very much. All right, so basically um, worldwide, this is becoming an epidemic. Uh, and it's interesting, just before I gave a lecture, I looked in the, just for the heck of it, the statistics in the Philippines, really no different than any other place. We all seem to have this problem here and it's becoming more and more prevalent as we get an older population and it's not just a disease of women, it's also a disease of men. You can see here, 52% of all the women over 65 have some form of osteoporosis or osteopenia and at least 44% of the men. And I got a feeling that's even higher. So you can see it affects a lot of our population and it's not going away. And, and this is some sobering statistics here. A woman who's 50 years old has a similar lifetime risk of dying from complications of osteoporosis as she does from breast cancer. And basically, you know, when you get a hip fracture, there's a 20% chance of mor morbidity and mortality, mainly morbidity, um, in the first 12 months. So these are not things to be taken lightly by any means. All right, so basically we know there's a couple of different, we have the, first, the primary osteoporosis, then we have secondary osteoporosis. We know it comes from kidney failure, liver impairments, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, malabsorption syndrome, and multiple sclerosis and chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases and a host of other medical conditions. So basically, again, looking at the risk factors, uh, we know that the females over age 50, they have basically a small size. Uh, usually it's white and Asian women are at a higher risk. Okay, and then some of the other risk factors, you know, the low estrogens in women, low testosterone in men, a diet low in calcium and vitamin D, uh, smoking, lack of exercise, and ex excessive alcohol use. All risk factors for other things are certainly a risk factor for osteoporosis. And again, look at the, the osteoporotic fractures compared to other diseases. 
And we can see way, way more fractures than we can see, for instance, heart attack, strokes, and breast cancer. So basically, we can see that it's a very important and ominous problem. And again, we can see here the various countries, U.S. Caucasians, very high. Um, and then as we get to, to Turkey, very low. Uh, and, you know, the Philippines are somewhere, you know, in this area here, I would suspect. Okay, and then again, you can see as we age and as that T-score becomes uh, a greater negative number, the risk of fractures becomes higher and higher. And again, this just shows the sobering statistics, how this is becoming more and more of a problem. Uh, you can see here, we went from 43 million back in 2002 to now 61 million in 2020. And again, you can see here, the United States and look at Asia, much uh, high numbers there. And, and again, we can see here, we have fractures from osteoporosis, we have hospitalizations. You know, there's a lot of healthcare dollars that are spent on the treatment of osteoporosis. You know, people with, with fractured hips, it's very expensive to treat them. Uh, you know, people that uh, have fractured spines, again, it's expensive to treat them and they have to go to the emergency room, have to go to doctor's offices, get therapy, et cetera. So a lot of things. So we must realize that osteoporosis also, unfortunately, is a silent disease. Many times the first symptom is when someone sustains a fracture. So it's not like it's gonna give you some symptoms ahead of time where you have a knee arthritis. You say, oh, I'm starting to get pain in my knee when I walk a lot. You're not getting any symptoms until you may have a fracture. So that's one of the problems that we get. Now, what are some of the recommendations? Well, you know, screening labs, well, that may be good for secondary osteoporosis. For primary, it's not gonna necessarily help us that much. I mean, these are some things we do, a sed rate, maybe a blood count, protein electrophoresis, but these really are not all that good, quite honestly. There's really no good screening per se. Now here we can see here some other guidelines and, and I give you these slides and you know certainly go back and look at these at your leisure. You can get a hold of Jim and I can send my, my talk there. I certainly have no qualms about you guys looking at it. The main goal here is for everybody to learn, okay? I'm not you know, worried that you're gonna copy my slides or something, uh, not worried about that at all, okay? So basically, um, we have some screening intervals, you know, sometimes if you have severe osteopenia every year, osteoporosis, you should be screened every year. If you just have a, a mild osteopenia, maybe every two years or something like that. Um, and basically when we look at how we diagnose these things, Bone density study is still the gold standard. Other names for this are a bone scan, a DEXA scan, a BMD bone test, bone density test, bone densitometry, different names, basically the same thing. Now the DEXA scan basically is a dual energy X-ray absorption study, more or less. And basically it typically, a lot of times will look at your spine and I'll look at your hips. Now there are some osteoporosis tests that look at the wrist and things like that, but really, the gold standard is looking at the spine and at the hips. And, and you'll see many, uh, many exams when they're done, they'll actually mention these two different uh, areas. And you can see here the principle of the DEXA scan, X-ray beams pass through the bone and the beams are not absorbed and they're detected on the other side of the body. And again, the denser the, denser the bone, the more the beams are gonna be absorbed. So the DEXA scan is probably the best osteoporosis screening tool. Uh, and we think that the bone density of the hip is a better predictor for fracture risk than the spine. The spine, for some reason or other, has more arthritis in it, and that could be some, some, give you some, basically, some values that may not be as correct as we'd like. So basically, your really best is to use the hip as your diagnostic uh, study. And you have two scores there when you do a DEX score. You have the T-score, which basically uh, is the number of standard deviations from the mean bone density. And then you have the Z-score, which is calculated like the C-score, but it uses age-matched normal population. These are both important, and you need to look at both of them when you're uh, evaluating someone to see what the disease profile they have is. Then there's some other scans, but I'm not really gonna worry about those too much because again, I don't think that these are as accurate looking at the calcaneus or the fingers or the tibia, not as good as the two gold standards. Um, and here's how we basically change in bone mass by age. 
you can see here, you know, around age 40 or so, we're at our peak bone mass. And then we start declining both men and women. You know, men may be not as steep a decline as women, but nevertheless, it affects all, uh, all of us, both, a, both the sexes, so to speak. Now, women basically develop osteoporosis at a younger age than men. Men may take about 10 years longer on the scale, so to speak, to really develop a lot of symptoms. Now, a lot of osteoporosis has to do with calcium control. And we could spend, you know, quite some time on this particular slide. Uh, basically, parathyroid gland glands have a lot to do with this parathyroid hormone. Uh, it releases calcium from the bone. Calcium is reabsorbed from the urine by the kidneys. Uh, and it, oops, let me go back to that slide a little bit. And then basically, it can go back into the, uh, into the circulation and go back into the uh, bone. And again, everything is kind of related to each other. You have the parathyroid hormone, you have your kidneys, these are, and the thyroid gland. These are all important as far as treating osteoporosis and maintaining osteoporosis. Now, here's the real gist of the matter. Um, osteoporosis, the disease. Basically, we have normal and abnormal bone turnover. Now, an osteoclast basically breaks down the bone. Uh, it creates erosion. It creates a, a erosion cavity, so to speak. Now, um, a prolonged resting period uh, can actually make more osteoporosis because it has the osteoclasts are more active. And we can see here, if we get osteoblast, we're going to have a stronger bone and it's going to be much better for the patient's health. Now, here's the bone remodeling process. Okay, so we have basically resting here, then the osteoclast comes into being, then we start getting macrophages. We start seeing now how the immune system and regenerative medicine is going to start coming into play because we start having the immune system having an effect on osteoporosis. And what do we see here with the macrophages? All of a sudden, we have the osteoclast that's causing resorption. All of a sudden, the macrophages are starting to cause a reversal of the process. And guess what? We start getting the osteoblast becoming active. And lo and behold, we get formation of bone and we get mineralization of the bone. So we can see here that this is the bad process here. This is the osteoporosis. And here's where we want to be. We want to start increasing the strength of that bone. Here's the old bone. Here's the new bone. So we're putting all this new bone down if we can treat it properly. Whereas here, we're just basically losing that bone and going from there. Now, uh, there are some biomarkers in osteoporosis that probably are going to take on more importance as we go on. And these two biomarkers are NTX, basically it's a telopeptide, and CTX. Um, and these basically are regarded as being good markers of osteoporosis to see if you're making progress in your treatment. It's expensive to do these tests and, and they're really Quite honestly, I don't think I've ever ordered one on somebody, but I'm going to look into it to see if I can find a lab that's reasonably priced that can really do these things, because that'll tell me how I'm doing, if I'm making progress or not. And we can see here that, again, it goes down to osteoclast reabsorption. So we can see how, again, it's collagen. Remember, bone is made of collagen also, type 1 collagen, so an important aspect of things. Now, how do we treat osteoporosis? Well, um, a lot of people are treating osteoporosis with bisphosphonates. And that's pretty much the standard treatment that we've been using for a number of years. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with these things. First of all, there's a lot of non-compliance. Patients don't like them. There's a lot of GI side effects. Uh, sometimes the medicine can be expensive. Uh, sometimes the patient doesn't think it's uh, an effective medicine. And, and there's a lot of side effects with these also. Now, who should you treat with an osteoporosis or should you treat with biphosphates? Well, if anyone has a T-score of a negative 2.5 or greater, then they should probably be treated. Or if somebody had a hip or vertebral fracture, then they probably need to be treated also. Um, and again, this is the National Osteoporosis Foundation treatment. Um, this is what they recommend. Again, you know, these are things that we're doing, but we're not so sure how good they really are. Now, calcium and vitamin D, extremely important. Let me go back to that. Now, vitamin D, um, you know, it's very important to give your patients vitamin D. 
The problem is you don't know what a good vitamin D level is. So I always tell my patients, I want your vitamin D blood level to be close to 100. So I usually recommend at least 5,000 units a day without any hesitation, okay? Calcium, basically um, 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams a day seems to uh, um, work, but it does have some increased risk with kidney stones and even cardiovascular disease. So there's no free lunch. I mean, we're giving patients, patients calcium. It's going to help their bones, but it's going to, you know, hurt their hearts or hurt their kidneys. So we got to kind of do a balancing act there. Now, vitamin D, extremely important, okay? Vitamin D shouldn't be a vitamin. It's a hormone. It's one of the most important things one can take. If I had to go to a deserted island, this is one of the things I want to take with me. Now, what do we get vitamin D from? Well, sunlight, fortified foods, egg yolks, um, fish oil, saltwater fish, liver uh, supplements, and you want that vitamin D level to be close to 100. Uh, very important about that, okay? Now, again, these are some recommendations from the Osteoporosis Foundation about calcium and vitamin D. I mean, they're saying 800 to 1200. Believe me, that's not gonna do it for a lot of your patients. 5,000 a day, and then, then after a while, get a blood test and see whether your vitamin D is. <clears throat> now, these are the various osteoporosis drugs. <clears throat> And we can see here we have some anti-resorption drugs, and most of the most of these bisphosphonates and other osteoporosis drugs, what they're really trying to do is prevent the resorption of the bone. They're not really trying to strengthen the bone, and that's one of the problems that we run into. They're really not strengthening the bone. They're just trying to prevent the the damage from occurring. They're trying to kind of stabilize the damage, but not try to repair the damage. And you can see there's a whole host of things here: the bisphosphonates. You have selective estrogen receptors, you have calcitonin, and you have some hormonal replacements also. Um, now, you have some bone forming drugs here. You have parathyroid hormone, basically for tail, and you have drugs with complex uh, mechanism of action. You have some of the uh, um, antibody uh, tri medications also. Now, the problem with for tail is, at least in the United States, the FDA says you can use for tail for two years then it has to be stopped because of the fact that after two years, at least in animal studies, it seems to have a prevalence of causing um, osteosarcoma in certain bones. So not a good thing. I'm surprised that it was even okay. Now Forteo itself in intermittent doses can, can work pretty well also. Uh, and again, we see the various uh, types of medications. Some of you are familiar with Fosamex, Aldactone, Boniva, Reclast, Avista, a whole host of different uh, type of medications here. And again, this just shows some of the FDA approved medications for osteoporosis. And you can look at this at your leisure and, and kind of study it. I'm not really recommending these medicines because I think there's better alternatives out there. And again, um, you can see here the global sales, osteoporosis is in there. All right, so basically, again, a drug timeline, we don't need to worry too much about that. But the mechanism of action is basically they want to inhibit the osteoclast function. The osteoclast is what's damaging the bone. So at least if we can go ahead and stop the osteoclast from eating away the bone, at least we've kind of have a steady state. And then we can hope that maybe the osteoblast will go ahead and form new bone. Uh, but man, that's not always the case here. So bisphosphonates, the, the problem with bisphosphonates are um, they sometimes will cause atypical fractures in the hip. I remember when I used to do a lot of hip fractures, once in a while, I have these nasty subtrochanteric hip fractures, and they were caused because the patient was on bisphosphonates. Also, as you know, they cause some necrosis of the jawbone, uh, which is certainly not a good thing. You know, people that have implants, all of a sudden, their oral surgeon is saying, hey, you can't, you know, your implants are going to fall out because you have this necrosis of your bone. And you can see here, here's some of the nasty subtrochanteric fractures that are known to be associated with bisphosphonates. Uh, so basically, uh, also, uh, they, they don't really work. 25% of the compliant patients failed therapy. These are patients that actually followed all the instructions of the doctor, and they still didn't do well. So not a good thing, okay? Now we have estrogen receptor modulators. Uh, these are selective estrogen receptors. Uh, there's a VISTA and a couple of other things. They seem to work a little better than the bisphosphonates, but basically, again, you know, there's all sorts of side effects to these. There's also the high risk of DVTs. 
You know, these are certainly not something that's welcomed in a woman who has breast cancer. Could it potentially predispose them to breast cancer? We don't know. That's a very intriguing question. Can any, any estrogen type compound increase breast cancer? Maybe, maybe not. So I, I wouldn't put my wife on these things because I think they're a little too dangerous. Uh, now, calcitonin is a peptide. Uh, inhab inhabits uh, the osteoclast formation. You can give it via nasal delivery. It's actually made from salmon of all things. Not sure why they had that, but it didn't seem like it worked too well. And it was a question of a cancer link to it. Uh, monoclonal antibody, that's sort of the newest thing, prolia and things like that. They're given subcutaneously every six years. Um, these are man-made. Uh, they do seem to affect the immune system. Uh, but again, we're just not sure. There's a high cost, they're injection. Uh, there's a reasonable benefit, uh, but we just don't know. The jury is still out on these somewhat. Now, these are the various singling pathways for bone remodeling. You have your osteoblasts right here, which can make bone formation. Then you have your osteoclasts, okay, which basically do bone resorption. And then you have mechanical loading. Now, all these factors, this is where regenerative medicine is starting to come into play because all these factors are kind of interrelated with each other. You have parathyroid hormone and you look at, you can see here, he said, wait a minute, PTH, bone resorption, PTH bone formation, because basically it can do both things given the circumstances. PTH in smaller doses actually can really do well with bone formation, but in higher doses, it causes bone resorption. Now, be honest with you, I use a small amount of PTH in many of my stem cell procedures because it, PTH can dramatically increase stem cell output from the marrow. Uh, it can also prep the cells to work more efficiently. A lot of interesting things there. Uh, so something to bear in mind. Now we start getting some of uh, the osteoprotogerin, okay, right up here. This is a protein that we have, and we can see here how that's going into play here. And then you have something called the rank, which is basically a receptor uh, activation of NF-kappa ligand beta, okay? NF-kappa beta. You know, now what is NF-kappa beta? If you guys remember, that's a major pathway in the body of inflammation. So we're now thinking that osteoporosis is maybe an inflammatory disease, maybe even an autoimmune disease. And, you know, this is kind of the prelude now of getting into the regenerative medicine stuff. So again, parathyroid hormone, we talked a little bit about that, okay? And again, osteoporosis medications, we talked about that. And again, osteoporosis medications. So these are the various drugs that, that are being used now. This is the, pretty much the, the newest thinking, so to speak, of some of these drugs. And again, why reasons for osteoporosis patients not wanting to start treatment? A lot of different things. Now let's move on to regenerative medicine, okay? So basically, okay, is osteoporosis an autoimmune mediated disorder? Most likely it absolutely is, okay? And it's like many other autoimmune diseases. It probably uh, is autoimmune. It's basically the answer to it may very well be in some type of stem cell treatment. You know, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that. We're now getting some, some good results using mesenchymal stem cells to reduce inflammation, et cetera. And the same is going to be held with the osteoporosis. Now, again, osteoporosis and the immune system. We can see here, oop, go back there for a moment. We can see here, we have uh, the native T cells. We have the various uh, interleukins, interleukin-2, interleukin-4. Interleukin-4 really has an effect as a hematopoietic uh, type of interleukin. You have uh, TGF beta, interleukin 12, again, TGF beta, and we can go here. Now you start having your immune system, uh, TH17. Basically that's dealing with a lot of autoimmune conditions. Then you have T1, T2. Now we have the T regs. If you remember the T regs basically help fight autoimmune conditions. So an important thing, if we can stimulate T regs, then we really may be accomplishing something. So we basically want to be here. We want to basically not be over here. So you can see here, these guys on this side are basically stimulating the osteoclast. They're eating away the bone. Whereas over here, we're basically 
trying to increase the bone by the osteoblast. For instance, like a T-reg, what do we have? IL-10, what's IL-10? IL-10 is basically cortisone, like a cortisone with no baggage. It's a marked uh, master anti-inflammatory cytokine. So that's why those things are important. Now, you can see the various basically uh, cytokines and interleukins and their effect on the osteoporosis and where they affect. So like IL-10, it's T-reg cells, anti-inflammatory, suppresses bone resorption. Okay, and then you can see IL-6, which is a master inflammatory cytokine, activation of osteoclastogenesis. Basically, it's gonna eat away the bone. Um, so all these things have, have bearing on each other. And now you can see how when we start looking at this, we can start trying to figure out, well, how do we figure this out? What can we do to stimulate certain of these uh, cytokines and interleukins to basically make things work better? Okay, so these are some abbreviations here. Osteoprotogerian, okay, that's what they call a rank inhibitor. Okay, prolia works like this as does estrogen. But we like to look at this from a point of view of the uh, biologics and things like that and, and regenerative medicine. Okay, so you can read these and, and go over them. It's, it, this is a bit complicated. I'm not sure how much of that you really need to know, uh, but this shows you a picture of it. Now, guess what we have here? Regenerative medicine again, MSCs and HSCs, okay? Now, most likely the, uh, the MSCs here that we're talking about are gonna be macrophage twos. Remember, macrophage ones are inflammatory, uh, excuse me, not macrophage, excuse me, the MSCs, um, mesenchymal stem cell two. Uh, this will basically be basically going ahead and trying to cause more bone formation by stimulating osteoblast. Now, HSCs, if they're treated in a certain way, they become osteoclast precursors and they become osteoclasts and basically start eating away the bone. <clears throat> so how we manipulate our stem cells may have a significant effect on the osteoporosis. So we know, for instance, that, you know, MSCs are gonna be very good for strengthening our bones. So we wanna basically increase them. We don't necessarily want the HSCs, at least, in this particular case, HSCs are not necessarily our friend. Now, inflammation, like I say, it's very important. Uh, and it's just basic regenerative medicine. IL-1, IL-7, IL-17, VEGF, IL-6, things like that. So you have a monocyte, <clears throat> it can become an osteoclast precursor, pre-osteoclast, and then becomes an osteoclast. Osteoclast, remember, eat away the bone. And you can see here the various um, interactions between these two. So basically, IL-1, IL-7, IL-17, these are causing inflammation. Remember, bone is an inflammatory process, and, and that's what we have to realize. And again, uh, I go over this rank one more time. It's a ligand. Basically, it's something that the, the cells can attach to. Uh, and it's expressed by the osteoclasts and their precursors. And if you basically can nullify that effect, you can basically stop the osteoclasts from really uh, working that well. And again, we can see here um, osteoclastogenesis. It's an inhibitory factor. And basically, bone resorption is inhibited, and it causes more bone formation. Basically, we want to get the osteoclast. So basically, what we're doing here is we're trying to nullify that effect of the osteoclast. Oop. Go back there. And you can see various hormones, cytokines, and growth factors will cause bone formation. <clears throat> you know, when all is said and done, you know, a lot of these medicines are attempting to, to do what we're trying to have nature do. And, and that's the important thing about this. Now, here's some studies of stem cells and osteoporosis. Back in 2010, the University of Michigan had a study um, and they use very small embryonic-like stem cells, which are one of my favorite cells to use. Um, and these cells can form bone and bone marrow. And then there was a second study that they did in 2013. Uh, they used the same V cells and cranial defects of mice. And again, the V cells were able to grow the bone and the cranial defects. So at the University of Michigan, they're very high on the V cells as I am also, I think it's a very important aspect of how we can get things better. And again, just a little, we've, I've talked about B-cells to you guys in the past. Uh, these are basically uh, 
found in the blood. We can give certain supplements uh, to increase the output of these cells from the bone marrow. But remember, uh, these V cells may be found in the blood, but they're basically quiescent cells. They're basically asleep. They have to be awakened. They have to be stressed. How do we stress them? Well, we give them basically low oxygen and we stress them with four degrees centigrade. And that's what basically awakens them. And once they're awakened, then they can help. And we've had some very good results using these cells. Uh, again, some more things about these cells. Very small cells, only one third the size of a regular stem cell. And again, they're activated by various physiologic stresses. <clears throat> now, um, they basically, we want to prevent premature activation of these cells. So again, we like to treat them with hypo, excuse me, with high, uh, hypo oxygen and basically hypoxia, that is, and the cold temperature. Now, in our studies of using these V cells, we had a 14 to 29 percent improvement in lumbar spine bone density in basically a year. Now, you show me any medicine that can cause that kind of improvement. And in the hip, we had a 5 to 29 percent improvement basically in six months. I mean, this is unheard of. And we're going to try and write a paper about this to just show how good they are. Now, um, there was another study using um, human amniotic stem cells in mice. This was the University of London. Now, I don't want people to confuse this with these amniotic stem cell products, quote unquote, that, that have been sold in the United States. Those products basically have no stem cells. They're just basically maybe some growth factors. The cells are all dead. So you cannot compare those to this study because this is the real deal. This is where they're actually using live amniotic cells. And we can see here what the mesenchymal stem cells can become osteocytes. And we can see here the MSCs become, they go to adipogenic differentiation, osteogenic and chondrogenic. So they can form it. So basically what I'm looking at is, and, and I've kind of wrote this, written this as a blog in the past, uh, what I call the final frontier. We're using NAD, and we'll get into that shortly. We're basically getting rid of senescent cells and using stem cells to really fight osteoporosis. Now, this is what I call the stem cell aging pathways. I gave you guys a lecture a couple of months ago on these pathways, and these pathways are very important in, in the treatment of osteoporosis. And one of the important guys is right here, mitochondrial function. Like most things we're discovering, the mitochondria, when they're diseased, they cause all sorts of other kinds of diseases, and they certainly cause a problem in osteoporosis, okay? So we can see here some of the various um, things that can happen from the type of uh, stimulation that you'll do. Telomeres, for instance, that's very important. Um, the sirtuins, reduced cellular senescence, these are all important aspects of treatment. Now, mitochondrial damage is a leasing cause of osteoporosis. When all is said and done, when the mitochondria become sick, so to speak, the cells don't function very properly and osteoporosis rears its ugly head and continues to get worse and worse. Now, <clears throat> sirtuin 1, S1, is a positive regulator in vivo bone mass and a therapeutic target for osteoporosis. It's a pretty landmark study. Now, if you can stimulate the sirtuins, basically, what do we know with sirtuins? Well, basically, the sirtuins are stimulated by a number of various supplements, resveratrol, terstilbin, NAD, et cetera. That should really help with osteoporosis. And this is a good article to go read, okay? Then the sirtuins and foxos, that's another pathway, the foxos, and osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. Again, an important article to read. Um, so we can see here the foxos. Basically, what does it do? Osteogenesis, uh, you're basically making bone. Uh, it can basically, uh, excuse me, eliminate some of the quiescence of some of the uh, cells. And basically, it's going to make more osteoblast function. Again, this is something that you can read about. Uh, is there a link between mitochondrial damage and osteoporosis? Here we see here mitochondrial damage and bone degeneration and osteoporosis. And this is from uh, University of Pennsylvania. Basically, it was some vet studies, but basically we can see here that uh, most likely you're getting more with the dysfunctional mitochondria, you'll have more osteoclasts that become functional. And that's not what we want. We want the opposite. We want more osteoblasts. 
And again, the sirtuins are so important in so many different ways, but now we're really starting to see the importance in osteoporosis. So the drugs that can target the sirtuins, basically it's probably a new generation of therapeutics for osteoporosis and other bone related disorders. They have a question mark there, but there's no question mark anymore. This is actually the case. I mean, if you target the sirtuin pathways with NAD, let's say, you're gonna definitely have a patient who's gonna do better, okay? And we can see here, increased NAD, increases the sirtuins. If we increase that sirtuin pathway, what happens? We get a blockage of the osteoclast and we get stimulation of the osteoblast. What do we get? Increased bone. Let's go back to that one more time. And again, MSCs go to the point of being an osteoblast, okay? So basically, what are some of the organists? Resveratrol, some other medications, terstilbin, but NAD, intravenous NAD especially, is really something that could probably work very well with um, osteoporosis. You can see here again, the sirtuins, basically the osteoclasts are blocked. We have osteoblasts, we have increased bone, and you can see the various things that can affect this. NAD, the agonist, aging, et cetera. So senescent cells is another important thing. Another great article to read. This is another classic article. Targeting cellular senescence prevents age-related bone loss in mice. And probably the same thing in people, no question about it. Uh, and it makes perfect sense too. And you can see here, inhibiting cellular senescence is a new therapeutic paradigm for age-related osteoporosis. This is from the Journal of Endocrinology. Um, that was from 2017. And we can see here, again, all the pieces are starting to fit together now. If we can eliminate the senescent cells, basically they're not gonna affect the osteoclast, which is not gonna cause bone resorption. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna have uh, basically an increase or no change in osteoblast, which is gonna increase bone formation. So you need to get rid of the senescent cells. It makes perfect sense. These senescent cells, what do they do? Well, remember we went, we were talking a little bit before about the various cytokines and other growth factors, interleukin-6, interleukin-1. Well, senescent cells, that's what they secrete among other things. They're gonna make those osteoclasts more powerful. So again, just to kind of review the difference between a senescent and a quiescent cell. When I use the V cells, those are quiescent. They're cells that still have the ability to replicate given the right circumstances. A senescent cell has lost that ability. Basically, it, it's a damaged cell, it's damaged goods, it secretes various types of anti, or I should say of, of inflammatory compounds, which really can cause some problems. And again, we can see here, senescent cells cause all sorts of havoc, including havoc to your bones. Uh, and we've kind of discussed these before, and you can read about these. These are, again, these cells present a huge problem, and osteoporosis is just one of the problems that they present, okay? And these are some of the ways that we treat it. Uh, Dastatinib uh, is basically a leukemia medicine we're using off-label. Uh, I found if I buy it from India, it's fairly inexpensive. If I use it in the United States, it's $500 a pill. From India, it's about $8 a pill. Cursetin, over-the-counter, works very well. It's a good synolytic agent. Another thing is fistin. That also works very well. And this will actually help your patients with osteoporosis. These are various synolytic agents. Interesting. A lot of people don't realize metformin is also a synolytic agent, okay? Uh, fistin I mentioned, uh, cursetin, and uh, some other ones. Now, by eliminating senescent cells, we increase bone formation. Um, Basically what happens is, what we do here is, if you can see here, the senescent cells basically will increase bone formation. And um, by increasing bone formation, I should say by getting rid of those cells will increase bone formation. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. I'm not sure if my computer went, no, I guess not. It's still functioning. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, because it looks like the lights went out here, but okay, that's good. At least I'm still online. Okay, so again, we can see here, an interesting thing is melatonin. Melatonin, I'm going to start using that because it seems to have some very good effects on basically preventing osteoporosis. What does it do? It increases osteoblast formation and it increases other cells. And with that, I think we're done. Now, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Joe.
You just Let's see uh, if I can put a light on. Hold on, Jim. I think my light went off for whatever reason. I'm in pitch black here. Hold uh, on. Okay. Can you can you show your face? Yeah, I'm gonna put the light on. I hope you'll be able to see it. Okay. And then the light went out for whatever reason. Okay, so maybe uh, something just went. Now you can see my pretty face or ugly face. I don't know what you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, can, we, can, we can see your face. Uh, Dr. Joe, I have a question. Yes. Uh, with what is available to us right now, of course, the NAD, the intravenous NAD is also available here. How often do you give it for a patient with probably uh, uh, science? Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm trying to make a protocol for that. Uh, that's a very good question. How you know, And we're looking into getting some NAD levels. And so stay tuned. But I'm thinking you want to, first of all, put the patients on oral NAD on a daily basis. I myself take it every day. I take about 400 milligrams a day of NAD. I take it from a company called um, Foreign Research. It's made in the United States by a company called Chromadex. But I think intravenous NAD would probably be good at least once a month, maybe 500 to 1,000 intravenously. Okay. And there are ways of increasing the absorption and having your patients tolerate it better. Uh, trimethylglycine. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you ever, have you used any NAD intravenously, Jim? Yeah, we have here. Okay. Yes. Do you have patients that sometimes get chest pain and things like that from it? So far, no. You give it slowly or very or rapidly? Uh, well, we, we usually do it slow IV. Uh, over 15 minutes. 15 for how much are you giving? Um, the concentration available here is, I think, uh, one vial, I think is 500. That, that doesn't make sense because 500 milligrams, most people are going to take a couple hours to take. Okay. I don't know what the dose is that you're getting, but NAD is something that people have trouble taking intravenously. They get chest discomfort. Now, if you give them TMG ahead of time, that seems to help it. Now, the craziest thing is, you know what really helps very well? A cup of coffee. Oh, really? <laughs> if they drink a cup of coffee while they're getting intravenous NAD, they'll have almost no symptoms. Wow. So just to let you know. But okay, so you can definitely use NAD in your practice. You can definitely use quercetin and fistin so you can get rid of the sen senescent cells. And you know the V cells, we can teach you guys how to do that. And yeah. you can start it because it's not, it doesn't require a very exotic lab equipment. It requires yeah. some very simple kits. It requires a refrigerator to put them overnight at four degrees centigrade and that's it. Yeah, you, you taught me that and you gave me kits. I have, I have here about five kits left. You know, my, they can always, my staff can always kind of, you know, give you a little primer on how to do it again if need be. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, with all these regenerative treatments, do you still, let's say patients would, uh, would still be taking calcium and uh, maybe vitamin D would, would that still? Well, vitamin D for sure. 5,000 units a day. No question about it. I'm every day I'm taking it. I don't know if you can appreciate there, but I have a nice tan because I was at the beach this past weekend. It was a big holiday in the United States, our Independence Day. And um, I still get, get the sun, but I still take 5,000 units a day. So, and I think calcium is still important. Maybe there's a little cardiac thing. I'm not so sure, but I think it's important to take calcium still. Yeah, good. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm using, a, I'm, I'm treating a patient with osteogenesis imperfecta. For the last 15 years, Dr. Joe, and uh, he's been given different uh, regimen on, on anti-resorptive drugs, and uh, sometimes uh, he's, he's getting side effects. And we're trying to shift to doing V-cells, but uh, I've never done NAD for him yet because uh, uh, he's about, uh, is there an age limit for that? Because he's already 23 years old. What, what do you mean an age limit? I, I mean, uh, do you give it for young patients in AD? You know, we do once in a while. I mean, not that common. Now, I'm going to tell you, some of my professional athletes love it because it, it seems to increase their performance. So yeah. we'll give like um, American football players, they really feel much better if they take it. We'll give them 500 or 1,000, okay? We're, we're doing a little, little study also. We're giving one patient... His daughter works for me, actually, just to, this is between us now. 
and we're giving them 1500 milligrams a day for 10 days to see if we can help him with his Parkinson's. Okay. You know, a lot of these neurologic diseases, remember now, these are basically, we, we think they're a disease of the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And we know that NAD can make the mitochondria healthier. So that's what we're looking at anyway. Okay, one more last question, Dr. Joyce. Oh, of course. We were using the photonic chamber and there's a, and there's an indicator there. I think if I don't, if I remember it right, it's uh, the blue light or the orange light where it says it increases in AD. Well, increases. Um, or stimulates maybe. It can stimulate the mitochondria to produce more ATP. Yeah, 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 that's it. And, and, and it goes from there. Yeah. And Light therapy is very important. Yeah. We, we are using it right now and uh, we're, is 10 minutes good enough or should we do it 20 minutes? 10 minutes is probably fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 10 minutes is good. Again, you're going to stimulate those, those mitochondria to produce more ATP. More ATP is a healthier cell. A healthier cell, better chance of survival. Okay. Okay, Dr. Joe, thank you very much for- it's My pleasure. You guys all have a good day and I look forward to talking to you guys again soon. Right, right. Have a good so day. Things will change uh, as people, as more people are vaccinated and we can really- I hope so. Yeah. Look forward to going there with my wife. All right, have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Have Stay a good day. Everybody. Yeah, God bless. Bye now. Take care. Take care.